As Emil said, um, I wrote a book in, I think it came out in, two, in 2008, 2008. Um, part of the Australian, uh, Australian Screen Classics. And uh, Jane Mills, fantastic, very vibrant editor up uh, at the time working in Sydney at the Australian Film and Television Radio School when they had a publishing department. Um, uh, I think it was, I was at Adrian's launch, um, which was at Acme, uh, for Adrian did the first in the series um, on the Mad Max films. And he got this guy who I'd never heard of before, who's a speechwriter for um, Paul Keating. He's, he's someone really famous. Um, and he gave this incredibly boring talk, right, this introduction, kind of moaned about violence in society and stuff like that. And so I'm thinking, oh, God, this is a great start to Australian screen classics and writing about it. And I'm also kind of thinking, geez, what, is there going to be three, four? Will they stretch it to five kind of thing, you know? Because um, they're trying to ape the uh, BFI one, you know, the BFI classics and then the BFI modern classics. And so I'm thinking, well, I can't connect to any of this, right, this idea of, like, writing about Australian cinema in this kind of way. And Jane bumped, you know, she came up to me at the opening and she said, oh, Philip, we'd love to have you write something for the Australian Film Classic series. And I said, oh, really? Can I write about some, a film I really hate? And so she just kind of, like, stunned, looked at me, and I could read the thought in her mind, which was, did he just say he wanted to write a film about a film he really hates? Oh, anyway, Philip, um, what we blah, blah, blah. And so she just kind of like went on. And I thought, well, I, that's what I said. Um, and then about a year later, um, she emailed me and said, um, so we really want you to write something for the uh, screen, screen classics. And I said, well, Jane, as I said, I'm only interested in writing about a film that I hate. Right? Like, I don't see why I should have to write about a film I love. And at that stage, I'd never seen Priscilla. <laughs> um, <laughs> And uh, I, I, I said to her, I'll write about um, the Priscilla movie. And so I wrote a complete two-page breakdown, about 500 words, of the chapters that pretty much are in the actual book. Um, and then um, sent that off to her. I mean, I'd seen little snatches of it, right? Um, but I'd never kind of sat down and watched the film. <coughs> And then I figured, well, she'll either agree with this or she won't agree with this, you know, sort of thing that I've just kind of whipped up. And she and uh, Jane, who's very uh, inclusive, actually said, that's fantastic, Philip, we're going to go with it. And I thought, oh, OK, now I've got to, A, watch the bloody movie and then, B, write about it. Um, so then um, I watched the movie. I watched it through once, made some notes, then I watched it again. And then nine days, nine maybe up to ten days, wrote the book and then sent it off. Um, and it was very easy to do um, uh, in, 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 in many kind of ways. Um, and I, I have to say, the main reason I, I think I really did it is because I wanted to just have a book published that on the inside just says, as a, as a it just says, for Australia. <laughs> and so, I mean, look, I only do things to please me, you know, so writing a whole book just to do that, I think that makes me kind of happy. If someone else kind of gets something from the book, that's kind of fine. So what I'm going to do is read the prologue and the epilogue. And then you can fill in the blanks of everything else that I might kind of talk about um, uh, with the film. Now, if I come out, if I come, sorry, if I come off as a smart ass, um, well, that's obvious. If you, if you don't know me, then you really don't know that that's really all I am. Um, and what happens with a smart ass doing something like this, right, is that the best way to, to deal with a smart ass is to completely ignore them. Just pretend they didn't do anything, they didn't say anything, just to pretend that this book doesn't even exist. So that's a screen grab from just last week 
of Currency Press when you do a search for Philip Brophy and Currency <laughs> Press published the book. That's a screen grab from Amazon. No reviews. I think that must be the only book on Amazon that doesn't have a review. And then, worse, Book Depository, they actually grabbed the synopsis from the film and made out that that's what the book is. I mean, that is not me talking there about the film. So this is me talking about the film. So the first section of the prologue is called Reading Maps. Picture those 17th century maps of white Australia with names like Terra Australis and New Holland. They appear ill-formed, misshapen, like an embryonic blob sliding to the bottom of a sphere. Yet at their inception, those maps were plausible cartographic tracings of how a ship would circumnavigate the perimeter of a land mass so as to deduce its continental form. To the modernised eye of white Australia, those maps are wrong, quaintly so, not because their cartographic impulse nullified the extant territories inhabited by Indigenous people, but because white Australia has had its ratified shape burnt into its collective retina. Its fusion of continent, map and logo sums up Australia as a mass, an island to itself, an identifiable shape, an ideogram promoting recognition, a brand prompting jingoistic consumption. It encourages Australians to perceive this thing called Australia as a whole to which one's partial self can be attached and attributed. By extension, anything labelled Australian is aligned with this logoistic enterprise. Most things Australian are pre-labelled and self-proclaimed so as to enforce cultural associations rather than nurture discovery or allow repulsion. In this respect, Australian icons are like botanical and zoological specimens, categorised as being emblematic of Australia in order to prove the uniqueness of the Australian continent. Australian cinema has developed along these anthropological lines. It blares its Australiana to anyone within range, lest they feel beached upon a continent with which they cannot identify. Like verified cartography, corrected terminology, validated morphology and classified iconography, Australiana on screen is a desperate recourse to circumnavigate an Australian consciousness and prove its whole, its mass, its collectivity. This book that I'm reading from is a reading of a map. The map is the 1994 film, The Adventures of Priscilla, Queen of the Desert. To some, Priscilla is a thoroughly familiar movie, full of uniquely Australian sentiment and perspective. They would see gay, ro gay role models, moving comedy drama, beautiful landscape cinematography, a wonderfully camp sensibility, celebrated Australian stereotypography and an international film success that, according to the 2004 DVD, blitzed, Australia, blitzed overseas box offices and caused a near riot at the Cannes Film Festival. To me, Priscilla is as alien as the landscape that greeted the first convicts, prospectors and settlers. Across its terrain, I detect quite different things. I hear the off-station broadcast crackling of David Bowie's Let's Dance and Sister Sledge's We Are Family. I see a host of movies whose apparition are likely to have been invisible sprites to many. Sextet from 1978, The Man Who Fell to Earth from 1976, The Boyfriend from 1971, Cruising from 1980, The She-Creature from 1956, and Thelma and Louise from 1991. I flick the unlocked channels to pick up transmissions 
of actor John Mellion's Victoria Bitter television ads of the 1960s, the closing ceremony of the 2000 Olympic Games, the Sydney Gay and Lesbian Mardi Gras, and the three episodes of the Australian version of Queer Ear for the Straight Guy. By reading Priscilla as a map, I survey unlikely national formations, hidden bodily topographies, and polysexual voices, sounds, and images. By reading Priscilla more than merely watching it, I forthrightly accept all the wrong map making which locates the film and every other successful Australian film within a triangulated perspectival plane formed by Australian identity, Australian culture and Australian cinema. Australia particularly celebrates the celestial alignment of those three axes from which vantage point the nation can lay territorial claim to getting it right. For some, my reading of Priscilla will be as woefully wrong as those early maps drafted by Janzoon, Cook and Flinders. And hopefully so, for my intention in this reading is to get as much as wrong as possible. What you encounter in this book is less an analysis of the film's dramatic script and its visual narrative and more an assessment of the signs circulating within the movie. I leave others to discuss director Stephen Elliott as an Australian auteur, the film's performers as gay icons, and the overall artistry and popularity of the film's production. Inasmuch as Priscilla is accepted as indelibly Australian, my reading will follow the film's nation-building road trip as a meandering roadmap leading to colonised, territorialised and localised incidents of this thing called Australia. I take you on no journey, only a series of disjointed passages, some interconnecting, some regenerating, some negating. For rather than championing Priscilla's undisputed international success across 1994 and 1995, and its consequent enshrinement in the living museum of Australian iconography, my reading of Priscilla celebrates the great nothingness of white Australia and all the heady delusions and spindly neuroses which atmospherically circulate around its engorged mass. If my reading is deemed contentious, it is only because such a low threshold persists for critiquing Australia's nationalistic neuroses, particularly in its movies. A dumb semiotics has been fostered in Australian cinema, wherein Australia seems bent on seeking itself out, fawning over its cosmetic makeup and supposedly discovering its identity. Yet the reading of Australiana remains illiterate, ignoring the multi-layered levels of signification enlivened by semiological analysis and its linguistic practice of multiple readings and lateral associations. In cinema, this dumbness has been shaped by envelopes of pressure born of legislation and myth-making. The result is a national cinema that frightfully, indeed viciously, directs iconic representation and symbolic signification toward a funnel for extracting an Australianism whose elixir supposedly informs, entertains and engages by producing Australian stories for Australians. By virtue of its substantial success, Priscilla is a drop formed from that elusive elixir. My purpose in this book is to reambiguate Priscilla by pondering the atmospheric conditions which determine its audiovisual signage. My map reading is thus derived from sensing, sounding and tracing the semiotic verticality an iconic stratification distributed throughout the film. By getting wrong all the directed signifiers that drive the film towards its affirmation of Australian identity, a refluxive momentum will be established from which the film's sounds and images can be connected to a larger cultural terrain which does not automatically honour Australia. This reading then is irrefutably un-Australian. 
It is less concerned with how the film reflects local concerns and national aspirations and is more concerned with how the film can be connected to international and transnational concerns. Not to be confused with Aussie bashing, my reading of Priscilla yearns for an escape from this thing called Australia. In place, I suggest ways in which Australian cinema can be interpreted so as to open up ways in which Australia reflects itself and refracts all beyond its shores. <coughs> and beyond the film's shores we shall go in this book. We shall be sent uncontrollably to, among other things, screaming queens and silenced hags, chrome-plated buses and chrome-plated logos, rotating mirror balls and flying ping-pong balls, the Snowy Mountains hydroelectric scheme and Wataka National Park, wog boys and gay boys, lip syncing and post sinking, ABBA and Kylie, the Rolls Royce spirit of ecstasy and bad pup ecstasy, vaginal expulsion and colonic propulsion, that's the colonic propulsion one, Isadora Duncan's flowing scarf and Al Pacino's leather jacket, smelly fish and fragrant women. Asian brides and Aussie battle axes. Slabs of forex and abs like six packs. Ugly Australians and new Australians. Bad house music and bad film music. Transculturals and transsexuals. We will encounter self-loathing, self-hatred, self-immolation and self-annihilation. For those who want to see themselves on the screen, you are likely to find yourself here, by the busload, like strangers in your own strange land. You can gawk at the image Australian cinema continually projects to you. Consequently, my reading forms itself into a palindromic text, playing Priscilla backwards to you in its celebration of being Australian. Yet not once will I debate the film's professionalism, execution, craftsmanship, success and popularity. Bypassing such conservative chauvinistic criteria which qualifies Australian cinema's success, my close reading will be responding to Priscilla's tonality, the weight and porosity of its audiovisual texture it will lip sync its own soundtrack, which will not be a menu option on the DVD release. If petty thief come pre gay philosopher Jean Genet had been time warped and sent to a penal colony in Australia, then jettisoned to a far future on the eve of Priscilla's lauding at the 1994 Cannes Film Festival, he may have written a book like this one in order to circumnavigate Priscilla's mapping of the gendered body, the sexualised voice and the eroticised corpus. Mind fucked by transcultural historiography, Genet too would have been woefully out of sync with all sense of Australian cultural propriety bent on idolising the film's salacious bent. In the spirit of Genet's self-degrading recoding of the obvious, my reading drags Priscilla's appropriation of drag and honours the film as an, as an apotheosis of a unique brand of nihilistic glory in which white Australia excels. The epilogue. If Priscilla is about Australia, which is what so many people want it to be, then this book is my reading of Australia. The film is a portal to that national dimension and this book has entered its thick fog to chart its tonal contours and gauge its textual arrangement without any desire to shape Australia in the process. Maybe this book has also had little to do with cinema. If so, 
That is because maybe the phenomenon of Priscilla has little to do with cinema. Inasmuch as popular, iconic Australian films are embraced by wide, generalist audiences who would care little about cinema other than its escapist release, the bulk of critique, rhetoric and politic which builds a media raft for our films to sail the seven seas is rooted in the journalistic and rationalist discourses of sociology, politics, economics, law and industry. I, I just feel sick saying those words. <laughs> Australian films are locally celebrated because it's good for the industry. They did big box office. We're telling our own stories. Governments should now respond to these issues. Hollywood will notice us. But such flag wavers treat films as proactive scripts and political white papers. Proto-films, which are tagged rather than experienced. Culture as fabric and cinema as material are rarely, if ever, decisively handed in the regurgitative media hype of a successful Australian film. Australia still remains so insecure about its status, its history, its image, its identity, that it clings to instances of success without ever reading the signs of their condition or observing the climatic, the climactic transformations that follow their passing. In this sense, Priscilla, like a number of successful 90s era Australian films predicated on spectacularism, has occupied cinema in the same way that white Australia occupies the land. It momentarily commandeers the public eye like tawdry costumed masters and commanders bearing the same askew, unfounded, untested telescopography applied by Janzoon, Flinders and Cook as they attempted to circumnavigate the continent. This book is critically uncinematic to reflect that dislocation. It can be verified that Hugo Weaving, Guy Pearce and Terence Stamp are dressed in drag for Priscilla. But are not Russell Crowe in Gladiator, Hugh, Hugh Jackman in X-Men, Mel Gibson in Braveheart, equally dressed in drag? Transvestites making up, dressing up, seeking an inner self but unable to see their outer self. This is how Australia makes Australian movies. The nation seems to only recognise itself through gross caricature, camp reduction, obvious signage and monstrous drag. No wonder the rest of the world thinks Australia cinema is quirky. Priscilla's straight eye on a queer world grants us the most potent symbolic condensation of this uniquely Australian self-distorted portraiture formed like a chaotic web of twisted threads, reversed images, negative spaces, shadowed indentations, this dark jewel of popular culture is a mystical stone which especially grants male Australia the power to see itself for what it really is. The final credit listed in Priscilla declares that it was filmed in Dragorama. Actually, it was dragged in filmorama. Responsively, this book's reading demonstrates how I have tried on the film, stretching its spandex construction in ungainly ways to make it fit, because that's how Australian films stretch out of proportion anything they try on. Blacks, settlers, criminals, detectives, junkies, uh, landscape, cityscapes, <laughs> class, politics, music, songs, sex, gender, subcultures, mainstreams, ABBA, Kylie. Australia's self-image has never evolved from contact with a looking glass. It only sees itself through logos, brands and icons, streamlined and stylized, rather than impressed or reflected. 
This mania for designing determines that Australia's semiological composure, mapped throughout my reading in the book, is as intimidating as the continent's geological composure is awe-inspiring. Maybe that confounding compaction is the strongest feature of Australian cinema. If so, Priscilla is a solid Australian film. If there is a definitive image moment which encapsulates the spirit of Priscilla, it would have to be Felicia on top of the bus, posing with her scarf unfurling in the wind like chromed calligraphy. Looking carefully at the scarf as it swirls across the desert landscape, one can see the land and sky reflected in it. The chrome only superficially appears to be silver. Its highly reflective mylar surface mirrors the rich ochre of the Australian sand set against the vivid bright blue of the Australian outback's cloudless sky. Uncannily, this reflective capture of the sunburned country is rendered in the village roadshow chrome logo at the very start of the film. Back in the 70s, tacky chrome-leaded logos were everywhere. Nowadays, that same lettering hauntingly remains on bogan sign writing vans and hulking private tour buses, each traversing the land in search of making signs and finding signs. Similarly, the ominous corporate zoom out of the village roadshow logo bears down on the Australian desert like a spaceship visiting a scorched geosphere. Its chrome-plated surface literally and conceptually reflects what Australia still consciously presumes this continent to be, terra nullius, an uninhabited land of terribly beautiful ochre and blue belonging to no one. Because when one looks deep into Priscilla's rallying chrome plume splayed across the desert, one notes that despite Australia's internal cultural mandate to put itself up on the screen, no one is there. Thank you.